My name is TJ Kirk. I was born in Pasadena, California in 1985. I am six feet and six inches tall. I enjoy film and literature. I have no sense of fashion. I have poor hygiene. I'm often rude, intentionally irritating, foul-mouthed, and strange. I don't support our troops. I don't believe in the American dream. I don't believe in God. I don't like feel-good music or inspirational TV. I don't believe in manners, traffic laws, or honor. I'm not conventionally handsome. I'm not someone who would have been hand-picked to become a celebrity. Yet, for 200,000 people and counting, that's exactly what I am. I am the amazing atheist. I make videos about politics, religion, American culture, and whatever else tickles my fancy. I make videos about all of these things, and people actually watch them. People tell me I've changed their lives. People tell me I'm the smartest man they've ever seen. People also tell me they're gonna kill me or kick my ass. People tell me I'm the dumbest piece of idiotic shit to ever walk the earth. Either way, people listen when I talk. And that's not an empty boast, it's a verifiable fact. If you don't believe me, then consider this. You're listening right now. This is the story of who I was, who I am, and who I want to be. It's also the story of those who accompany me on my journey, and how that journey has changed my life, their lives, and the lives of my fans, and maybe the course of history. Just maybe. Who really fucking knows? You know, I think my success on YouTube is related in a lot of ways to the fact that even though I'm just sitting in front of a camera talking, I think people can kind of sense that in my mind I'm playing to an arena. And even though I'm, there's no music playing, I think people can still hear those hard rock chords that are playing in my head as I'm talking. I mean, I think that I became a rock star in the lamest way possible. Uh, and I never wanted to be a, a comedian or a social commentator or whatever the hell people want to call me. It's just kind of something that happens. It's good to have that uh, SLR. I could get a lot better pictures for this. Yeah. Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. That wasn't applicable to this situation. No, not at all. I was kind of <laughs> okay. I guess that is reason for America to be alarmed because. If someone like me can can sit there and talk about how literally every aspect of our culture is, is bullshit, and there are over a hundred thousand people that are like, yeah, I, me too, I agree, everything you said is accurate. I think that's cause for alarm for the establishment in a lot of ways. And I get the sense that there's a lot of people out there that you know, would be my fan if they'd heard me, but they just haven't yet. So, I represent a small sliver of a market that hasn't really been tapped by anyone else. And it's not the market that, that doesn't give a shit. It's the market that passionately doesn't give a shit. That goes beyond mere nihilism and actually turns uh, transgression into a strange form of optimism. I think it makes sense for me. Two in, uh, no, one in the hand is worth two in the bush, Scotty. Thank you for that valuable energy there. You ever meet people who actually sp uh, s say that shit like it's supposed to be like real wisdom? You know, if you have a kid who has a drunk dad who comes home and punches him in the face every night before he goes to bed, you know, that kid is, is going to be fucked up in the head, but one day he's just going to say, you know, I don't give a fuck anymore. Let that motherfucker punch me. I like it when he punches me. And I think that's, uh, that's the attitude shift that's happening in this culture. I think that, you know, I almost want to vote for Sarah Palin in 2012 just to see this country decline even further because it's just become this giant spectacle. It's like 
you know, some days I wake up and I want to aid America towards some sort of recovery, and other days I just want to aid it towards its own destruction. I don't know, it's, it's a difficult balancing act between... between actually caring about things and... and necessarily disconnecting myself from things so that I can deal with day-to-day -day reality and the things I read in the newspaper. see a, a place that's kind of lost its way and maybe grew up too fast. But I'm like that kid who just doesn't give a fuck anymore when he gets punched in the face. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of things that I've gotten out of TJ, I mean, it, he's more of a, of a person that I know. I mean, a lot of people, they, they see him as, and they see this generally with people in media. I mean, when you look through the computer you, or on the TV, you see just pixels and colors, and this is an image, a person, a celebrity. And, and, and so forth and and, and, and and a lot of people they, they see the internet there's a distance of relationship which is a, a cognitive illusion they, they use this distance as something which it really dehumanizes us but um, I think TJ's um, I just want to say that his his channel to me has been about de-stereotyping um, the various aspects of our humanity here we go do you need your porn enabled? Since my last video, Japan has been rocked by earthquakes and destroyed by tsunamis. Their earthquake was an 8.9. God damn it. Even their earthquakes score higher than ours. And I've always seen this. But it's like I just see TJ. Oh, that's my my fat fuck of a friend, uh, and I fuck with him and and mess with him, and, and and so it's very easy for me to how I look at him. We have to think of different vantage points between myself and others. Um, I I have a personal relationship with him. I think he's one of the closest people I've, I've ever had who knew me. In some ways, I think he knows me better than I know myself. Kiss. I never thought of that. Kiss mommy. No. Give me a kiss. Give me a kiss too. Love you. No. Sit down, woman. Cody make you look good. No, he won't. Close up on my wrinkles and my zits. He's good, but he's not a miracle. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like the crib keeper. <laughs> yeah, don't make Freaky Friday references, please. Sorry. I love that movie. I know. Um, it had to, had something to do with respect, though. Like, he, like TJ was. Um, being accused of not being respectful to the teacher, so um, <clears throat> when I talked to TJ about it, he was saying, "No, if respect were a river, and I was that river, you could step across me in one teensy tiny step." He didn't really have many friends because he was always more interested in making characters and creating a persona, whereas you know most people are just interested in the here and now. That's why, you know, I'd say is the main difference, you know. And a lot of people don't really realize that. I mean, now, with the, uh, the character of the Amazing Atheist, I mean, it's a lot closer to TJ's real personality. I think if there was a personality you'd want to project, that would, would be the Amazing Atheist. I mean, I would say they're very close, but I don't think they're exactly the same, one and the same. Me and Sky were walking past the fence of the playground, because we both got kicked out. And, uh... A bunch of the Seawood kids started like making fun of us and shit like, Oh, there's TJ and Scotty, they got kicked out and all this. And we're just like flipping them off like, fuck you. And they're like, ah! You know, because we actually knew that shit and they just like saw it on TV and we're like, Oh, I'll never do that because mommy and daddy say no.
So in ninth grade, I had a teacher by the name of Mr. Taylor, who, um, uh, this guy was a total fucking asshole. I remember he set the class down once and he told us this, uh, this really endearing little story about he had, um, he was on a road trip with his family and his son was in the back playing with a little styrofoam cup and uh, Mr. Taylor turned around and said, You stop fucking with that styrofoam cup! And the kid, you know, being a kid, just you know, kept playing with it, ignoring his father. And, um, you know, he, he, uh, he broke the cup and, you know, juice spilled. And Mr. Taylor said, oh, I pulled that car over and I went back there and I beat his ass! And I'm like, what the fuck? What's the moral of this story? That you're a douchebag? You know, so that, that kind of gives you an indication of um, the kind of guy Mr. Taylor was. But, um, you know, in ninth grade, I basically made the decision that I no longer wanted to participate in the life of a high school student. Um, I did not fit in socially. I did not do well academically in that environment. Uh, I basically couldn't function there. Um, you know, I, I, I felt... Uh, there's a scientific term called pseudo-speciation that's applied to when you dehumanize your enemy so that you can kill them more easily because it's hard to kill a human being. It's easy to kill someone who you've convinced yourself is subhuman. And there was some pseudo-speciation going on. I don't know if I was pseudo-speciating myself and saying, I'm not human, or if I was pseudo-speciating everyone else and saying, I'm the only human and all these people don't matter. But the point is that I was very disconnected from humanity in general at that point because I, I didn't I didn't share a common vernacular with uh, my fellow students um, beyond the vernacular I didn't even share their attitudes or their um, outlooks so um, for all these reasons um, it all kind of uh, culminated in me deciding that I could no longer be a part of that environment, right? Um, so I decided to drop out of school. I was already 16 in ninth grade because I, I think I'd been held back sometime in very, my very, very early education, not for academic reasons, because it was before we even started doing academics, it was purely for social reasons. So when I decided to drop out of high school, I told my parents. My father was very supportive because he had dropped out of school and um, gone directly to college. Um, my mom was very much against it. I think she was more of a traditionalist. She wanted me to do things the way that most people do them. You know, as a parent, you, you always want your kids to be, you know, the President of the United States. I don't know. You always have these high expectations for them. You want them to go to college. You want them to do, you know, all the normal milestones that people are supposed to do or as society tells us what we're supposed to do. And You know, when it's your first child, you like thinking, okay, he's not getting good grades, but he's, he's so smart. I don't understand what's going on. And you know, you go through the whole thing of doing IEPs, which are individualized educational plans, and you're working with these educator specialists that are supposed to be able to, you know, help kids that have, you know, ADD or whatever you were diagnosed with. And, you know, so you're, you're listening to these people they are supposed to be experts and they know what they're talking about and, and you're trying to do your best job as a parent. So what ended up happening was my mom organized this cabal of all of my teachers. She somehow pulled enough strings to get them all in one place at one time. And um, to have this, this meeting to see if I had any sort of academic future. And I went just to humor her. I knew that I wanted to drop out. Nothing that these people could say to me was going to convince me otherwise. I'm thinking, okay, we're going to get everything out in the open and this is going to work, you know, to, to TJ's advantage and, and we'll get him, you know, on the, where he needs to be. And so Mr. Taylor, who I can't even believe 
attended this conference. Eventually he gets sick of me insulting the school, insulting the student body, and he slams his hands down on the uh, desk and says, this meeting is a waste of my time. And uh, he said something along the lines of, you know, I don't want to be paying for your trailer or something. You know, quite an ironic comment from someone who is uh, employed by the state. You know, I'm thinking, these are the people, they're supposed to be teaching my child, but they could care less about being in this meeting. They're just here because they were told to be here. So, you know, we go through this meeting and we're talking about TJ's IEP and this one teacher says, so TJ, what do you want to do with your life? And TJ says, I either want to be a rock star or an author. Now, I know this because I'm his mom and I mean, I'm thinking to myself, you know, he could probably, a rock star thing, maybe not, but if that's what he wants to do, okay, I'm not going to tell him no. But the author part, I'm like, yeah, man, I mean, this kid fills notebook after notebook after notebook, and it's not crap. It's, it's good stuff. My mom, of course, started bawling, and, you know, after that, she was more supportive because she saw the kind of bullshit I was having to deal with. Um, so I dropped out after that, and uh, I can honestly say I have never regretted my decision to do so. It's never haunted me. I've never had even a moment of doubt that I did the right thing. That environment wasn't good for me, and I probably wasn't good for that environment. I mean, I don't think it was a turbulent time for TJ. I think it was actually probably a moment of uh, freedom. I mean, a lot of people, you know, especially celebrities, say, Oh, I, I didn't get my high school diploma. I really regret that. But it's just bullshit, you know? I think TJ would never say that. He would just say, like, I'm proud I didn't finish. Condell even admits that Muslims have been attacked by radicals who share his basic position. So I'm glad that Pat Condell can differentiate between himself and the radicals within his own ideology. But he can't extend the same courtesy to the Muslims of America, to the Muslims of the world, who don't all support terrorism, despite what his ignorant, fucking, moronic ass would have you believe. And lest anyone accuse me of being a secret Muslim, as always happens when I take this stance, I hate Islam. I fucking think it's stupid, repugnant, violent, and loathsome. But I also think that it has a right to exist in this world, as does any other fucking idea. No one has the right to commit violence against their fellow man. That's a given. But if you want to pray to a God and call him a law, and you want to say that he believes this or he believes that, then I think you have the right to do so. And I have the right to say that it's fucking retarded. But I don't have the right to tell you what you can build and where you can build it. Because this is America. Pat Condell, fuck you. But I support your right to say what you're saying. I met TJ. It's not a YouTube video, I can't shoot it like one. I started making YouTube videos. This isn't about me. Stop making it about me. Blech. It's just hard to do. I met TJ in 2008. Well, in person, anyway. And it was strange because I didn't really know what to expect. You know, you kind of get this really large personality online. And by and large, that is who TJ is. Um, he doesn't have a really good ability to censor himself. So it was kind of nerve-wracking to meet him, you know. I wanted to meet him by myself because I was dating a girl that I knew would not get along with him. So I really wanted to meet him on my own. Quit breathing so heavy. Damn heavy breathing piece of shit. I'm breathing heavy. You are? I can hear it like nasally, like... <laughs> like fucking Darth Vader. That's one thing about Dad, actually. That kind of reminds me of something. Is like, whenever me and Scotty used to fight, which, I mean, like, come on. We're the biggest fucking, like, belligerent assholes on the planet, for the most part. But no, our dad used to get really fucking upset about us fighting amongst ourselves. You know, you guys are brothers, you shouldn't fight! Like, 
you know, I don't, I don't like all this confrontation. But, you know, when, when it came to him arguing with us, like, he'd do it just as bad. You know, especially him and Scotty, man. Those guys were just like, they, they, they'd fucking almost come to blows sometimes. They'd be like, just totally in your face, like, both of them red and just like, <laughs> Remember the one time that, uh, fucking, uh, Dog D.O.G. died? Yeah. I, I came in the room, like, very sympathetic, and I'm like, Dad, I'm very sorry your dog died. Fuck you, sorry! I don't give a fuck what you have to say about it! You ain't a shit, a piece of shit! <laughs> and then I'm all like, you know what, fuck the dog dying! And they, they, they like, swung at me. And I just step back, and what the fuck are you doing? I will kick his ass, so I'm like, get out of my sack! <laughs> yeah. That was fucking crazy for sure. And Dad must have kicked Scotty out like a hundred times. Yeah, I got kicked out a hundred times for sure. And then like, you know, like the next day or like, maybe not even the next day, but like a few hours later, Scott and Dad would be like, I'm sorry, Scotty. <laughs> it's the same way, like, Scotty and Dad are much the same way. They'll have like these big, angry, like, shows of rage and talk about all the shit they're going to do. And then like, you leave them alone for like a couple hours and you come back and they're, they're pretty much like... I'm sorry, I didn't fuck me all that stupid shit. Really? Trying to make this country safe from immigrants and fags. And fags? Yeah. So lesbians are okay. Lesbians are a okay. They star in my porn. Dad, in front of me, driving his daughter to school. To high school. And I see him smoking a cigarette because I can see him in, in his mirror. And then I look over and I see his daughter look out a cigarette. I was like, are you shitting me? I'm like, for real. You're driving your daughter to high school and she's smoking in the seat next to you. Really? Yeah. season like it, it definitely manifests like in my videos and shit just like the a lot of the times when you see like that pure anger especially the anger that comes out about very minor things like people will wonder like why is he getting so angry I was actually kind of doing in my head like a parody of my father so random diner bitch fuck you fuck Pat Contel Tucker Carlson is a small-minded bigot. Why is it you morons have to ruin everything? Because that's how he was. It's like, the toaster doesn't work. He's like, MOTHERFUCKING TOASTER! GODDAMN DOESN'T WORK WORTH A FUCK! You know, and, and, you know, so... When I do the videos, and it was always very entertaining for me to watch, you know, because it's like, you know, someone getting that upset about something so trivial is kind of funny. So I kind of brought that in, into the stuff I do. He said he, he would always he always wanted to have meetings because we were all in business together, and he always wanted to have a fucking meeting every fucking day. He wanted a big long like one or two hour meeting where he could say the same things as he said in yesterday's meeting for about fifteen or twenty minutes and then go off on a totally unrelated tangent. Um, it was basically like an amazing atheist video that you're not allowed to leave. I mean, like, I, I remember the day pretty well, I guess. I was, uh, sitting there in my chair, doing my, you know, like, work. We just had a meeting not too long before, and Scotty was in there rubbing Dad's back because he had a lot of back problems. And, um, Natalie ran up to me, and she's like, you know, there's something wrong with your father. So I get up, and, I, you know, I could, I could sense the urgency there. And, you know, I run in there, and he's just kind of, like, sitting there, no, like, expression in his face. Like, his eyes are open, but, like, you can tell, like, there's nothing, there's no, like, awareness behind them. Yeah, so, nothing. so it's like, you know, he starts going blue and shit, and we're all panicking. We don't know what to do. None of us know fucking, like, well, Natalie knew CPR, yeah, but it was, wasn't doing anything. Yeah, she had CPR, and, you know, that was, 
At least, I guess, kept them alive long enough to, for the yeah. I mean, like the paramedics. The paramedics responded very quickly. Um, you know, it, it was like you know, it was, it was just a like a, a long horror show of a night because we brought him to the hospital. They got him, like, and they're like, "Oh, well, you know, he got in here quickly." You know, oh, and everyone was hopeful. You know, then then about four or five hours in there, the doctor's like, uh, "You know, there's three main arteries that go to your heart, and two of your dad's arteries are completely clogged with plaque." There was four, and there was three that was clogged. I think he said three main ones. Okay. But he said two of them are clearly clogged, and, and the one that's really pumping your, the blood to your dad's heart is weak. Yeah. And so th they put a stent in that one, that, the one that was still open, and that was so that was getting blood through, but the other two, I mean, were just, they couldn't even do an angioplasty on him, so. Yeah. He had really had no chance, and, he, and he'd been out that auction for so long at that point. He was basically, they said, you know. Severe brain damage. Yeah, if, even if he recovered, he would have severe brain damage, and that, that, that was this. He was on all the drugs, and they're like, his blood pressure is basically the blood pressure the medicine is giving him. He doesn't have any actual blood pressure. He got online one day, and he just linked me to a video. And that's all it was, and then he signed offline. And I didn't see him again for a couple days after that, and I was worried about him because I saw that the title of the video was, My Father is Dead. Hey everybody, Amazing Atheist here. Um, uh, I just got back from the hospital um, to make a... A uh, long story short, my father uh, died tonight. After my dad's death, Natalie, my stepmom, gave me like a thousand bucks to go wherever the fuck I wanted to go to just kind of like. Well, actually, you know, later on we kind of realized she fucking got rid of us so that she could fucking talk to the lawyers behind our backs and steal all the money we'd work for. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, um, I decided to go to Kia Cup to meet Cody because, I don't know. Cody seemed pretty cool. You know, I didn't really even have to sell it to him. He was just like, all right, man, are you sure you want to do that? Because I'll come. I don't know. I'd never, like, the Midwest was a very foreign place to me. Like, there was no, uh, there's no really likening it to the South. Because, like, everything is different. Like, being poor is different. Being rich is different. The way towns are set up is different. Uh, people's general attitudes walking around the streets is different. Like, there's the, the, just like, the look of buildings is so different. Everything is just so wildly disparate. So it was like, wow, it's like this whole other world. There was never any awkward shit between us, you know? It was just like we were friends right from the get-go. We had a lot in common at the time. I mean, we still do, but the things that we have in common now have kind of, you know, spider-webbed into a different area. But when I first met him, we were both dudes that didn't give a shit about anything. <laughs> yeah, he's broken key. Give me a second. I like this. This is the new emo trend here. Uh, look, how, look how far in that key is. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm turning the ignition to the afterlife. It's like vroom, vroom, just. <laughs> you don't care, man. Nothing matters, man. Nothing at all. That's a pretty good despondent look. Sometimes when, when I say things to Joel, like, and I know he's not going to because I've known him long enough, but sometimes he gets this look on his face like he's going to start crying. Right. You, you ever know. notice that, like, yeah. why? And he does that, like, fuck, I don't know how to react. <laughs> <laughs> like that. He's that like, like that, that's like the weirdest <laughs> time to look at him. It's like, it's okay, I'm just playing. <laughs> Thanks, dick. <laughs> <laughs> I probably shouldn't have explained a bunch of sociological things to him a minute ago. Because I was telling about like experiments and like trying to raise his awareness of social situations and how he fit into them. Uh -huh. So he's probably like ultra conscious of it now. <laughs> Is that true, Joel? Yes. <laughs> some guy has passed this at some point and been like, man, it'd be great if we could put a bunch of weed in there and just like fucking like put our heads in the semi. I like graffiti. Someone here says tuna is nasty. There it is. There it is. Tuna is nasty. I'm gonna zoom up on it. This here is the invitation, I guess, to my dad's funeral. Is uh inside there's the poem Invictus, which he used to have memorized. He would recite it all the time. Uh, it was kind of his little, it was his favorite poem, it was his creed in life, basically. He, he pretty much lived by this poem. Uh, 
Here's how it goes. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. In loving memory, Thomas James Kirk, Jr., born Monday, July 1st, 1946, Bogalusa, Louisiana, passed away Thursday, January 3rd, 2008, Lancaster, California. Celebration of life, 1 p.m. at Family Home. Arrangements entrusted to Haley Olson Murphy, Funerals and Cremations, Palmdale, California. And uh, there's this little Thomas Kincaid painting of a... Uh, I guess a staircase. Yeah, they didn't have anything a little bit more macho, which I think would have been better for him, but yeah. Heavenly little staircase, surrounded by flowers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad, so much, um, so much the pragmatist in a lot of ways, and then so much the idealist in others. Very strange juxtaposition of, like, absolute hard-ass cynicism and then childish naivete. You know, like one minute he'd be telling you like the most like brutal hardcore advice you've ever heard about how you really shouldn't give in to sentimentality. But then when it came to certain things, he was very fucking sentimental. Just another fucking bundle of contradictions like anyone else on the planet, you know? Smart man, just really brilliant man, great businessman, great at fucking telling stories, great at lying to people. He loved lying to people. You know, he would, he would tell anyone anything, you know. He got off on, on convincing people he was something other than what he was. Like, we just fly, you know, whenever we, were, we had a flight, you know, he would always talk up the person next to him, and whatever they were, he would convince them that he was the same. Like... If he sat next to an evangelical Christian, he was an evangelical Christian. If he sat next to a hardcore conservative, he was a hardcore conservative. If he sat next to a hippie, he was a hippie. You know, and he would mime their points of view, he'd spit it back at them, and they'd believe him, you know? He loved, he loved doing that to people because it made him feel superior. It made him feel like, man, these people are fucking stupid. They'll believe whatever I tell them. He liked that because he it made him feel like he was a really good salesman, and he was a really good salesman. He loved to sell things. He loved he loved being in charge. He loved being in control, and that's not a that's not necessarily a quality you want in a father because you know basically everything they do they're trying to control you in some way or another, and he's always manipulating and playing the angles. But on the other hand, you know, he gives out a lot of good advice on how you can do that yourself. You know, in some ways he was a role model, in other ways he was one of those anti-role models that you come across in life, like, I don't want to be like this. But then he gave me a lot of tools for the things that I do like to do. Because he and I, I think, have the same fascination with people and how they can be manipulated. But I'm more interested in manipulating people to to feel certain ways, and to look at things from my perspective. You know, he didn't give a shit about people seeing things his way. It was enough for him that he saw things his way. For me, I want other people to think the way I do, because, I don't know, I feel alone in the world a lot. I feel like my point of view is never reflected anywhere else. So, I figure that if no one else is is espousing my values and my belief system, then it's up to me. It's up to me to make that happen in the world. But, um, I don't know, maybe I have had some measure of success. Maybe the seeds I've planted will take root and one day, thanks to me, something will, will change. 
But, uh, I don't know. All I do know is, if that does happen, I owe a lot of the thanks to my father and not only the genes he gave me, but the lessons he gave me. And just the, uh, the insight into human nature and how people perceive things and what people really want from you. Even if it was cynical and somewhat depressing. But you know, the one thing I remember about that, about the time in Keokuk, was the last day that you were there, uh, and there's another point I want to make here too, but the, the, last, the last day you were there, you're like, because that was when I was first getting into videography, we filmed that poem thing or whatever. Right, yeah, it was fun. And uh, you're like, you know, there's going to be a time when I'm going to start making stuff, and we're going to make money together and do this shit for a living. And at the time, I was just like, oh, all right, DJ, whatever you say, man. <laughs> More pipe <of> dreams. <laughs> like... <laughs> Whatever you say, man, and here we are fucking a few years later See? actually doing that. Prophecy of TJ. <laughs> but do you remember when you fucking left because I had to sleep at the hotel because I got kicked out of the house? Yeah. And when you left, you like left $200 with me? Yeah, I remember that. Which totally saved my ass because I was able to get a hotel for a few more fucking days after that. Cody was like in such a bad situation and like... I just felt like, you know, I'm not, I don't need this fucking money, so I was just like, I wrote it, like, he would never have just taken it if I'd offered it to him, so I pretty much, like, wrote a letter, and then I, like, enclosed the money in the letter, and then I left. You, you're kind of confused, because you know, like, TJ cares, but he, but at the same time, like, he doesn't care about the petty shit. Like, he cares about Cody's ability as a person, and, that, like, and, that, that, and like, 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 Cody's really talented, and she just, oh, wow, you're really good at this, you know? I obviously won't say that because, I mean, everyone is, like, three guys. I mean, if you, if you comment on the dude, it's like sucking Cody's dick now, huh? Watch out. Did you make a trail, Stevie? No, that's not what we do. You ever see that guy's too too wet? Let me stand back. Come on, be quiet. This is awesome. Come on, damn it. Initially we met on MySpace, but I didn't know anything about him. I was, I guess, when I was growing up I was a religious nutcase, and so throughout my uh, early adulthood I was still still trying to go to church. I, was, I had moved from northern Ohio to like southern Ohio in Dayton with my boyfriend at the time. <clears throat> And um, he was an atheist, so we didn't really see eye to eye on religion and things like that. Um, so I wasn't really going on YouTube looking for videos on religion. I was just sort of like, okay, I'm, I'm cool where I'm at right now. I don't really need any sort of uh, enlightenment from anyone. <laughs> and so for like a week and a half or so, I have this friend, had this friend who, who lived in uh, New York at the time. We had grown up in Ohio together. And he was sending me links to these videos by this guy named The Amazing Atheist. And of course that totally like turned me off right there. And um, I didn't want anything to do with watching that. I didn't, like I figured he was just sending it to really offend me because he hated my whole religious nutcasiness. <laughs> I don't know, it just it never worked out with any girls I'd met or talked to. There'd been some that had come and visited that, uh, you know, just, you know, it. Maybe it kind of worked online and it didn't work in person and then there was other girls who it was like, you know, I talked to them but, you know, it was obvious that it wasn't going anywhere or I talked to them and, you know, I would scare them away or they would bore the shit out of me. 
he kept bugging me with all these links to these videos and so finally um, I clicked on one just to say that I, I watched it to get him off my back and the video I think was uh, killing your wife what not to do you know what I like murder with the intention of only watching about 30 seconds of it I ended up watching the whole video and um, I couldn't believe how much I had related to the, some of the things that he was saying in it because I'd still considered myself very religious and he was talking about bashing this bitch's head and on the table from being so angry and... A waiter or waitress or someone like that being rude to me just um, infuriates me to no end and I just thought about how much fun it would be to slam her head on that table 40 or 50 times and uh, see what that did for her attitude giving tips on how to kill people, it was like, you know, these things have been running through my mind for so long that finally somebody who can just go out there and say this shit and like not care what anyone says and I really, I don't know, something really sparked when I had watched that. When I was talking to Holly, you know, it was just like, you know, no matter what I would say, she was right there with me, you know. Um, I think that's part of how you know when, you know, a relationship is right is when you're always on the same page about things. When you're, when you say something and she follows it, or he follows it, or, uh, you know, whoever. I went to Walmart at like, I want to say like 3 a.m. and I called and he said, it's about fucking time, I've been waiting for you to call me forever. <laughs> and so uh, we talked for, I think, four hours on the phone until my phone died. Whatever, I'm gonna be surrounded by him. We going? What's the big deal about burning the Koran anyway? I mean, it's the faith, values, and morals of an entire culture of people, but it can be destroyed by the. What is this, a 61 cent lighter? I don't know. Not very expensive anyway. Yeah, you can speed this part up. My hair doesn't like the fire. Burn, motherfucker, burn! This isn't even the majority of the video, really. Although I think some of what I say inside, you can, oh, you can, uh, you can put on this. Two, go. Well, the Bible is... Well, the Koran is better written than the Bible, but the Bible sure does burn better. However, I'd like to give us atheists a sporting chance as well. The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. I just want to see how it'll burn. Come on, atheist book, you can burn. It's alright. The religious books did it. You can do it too. It'd be kind of weird if, the rel if this, of all books, was the one that refused to burn. Is God protecting this book, or do they just use superior quality paper? disagree with, burning a book that you disagree with is a lot better than burning a person that you disagree with. When did burning a symbol become something so taboo in America? 
Hippies burn the American flag when they disagree with the policies of the government. Christians should be able to burn the Quran if they disagree with the policies of Islam. And Muslims should be able to burn the Bible if they dis... Oops. <laughs> you just do it over. Whole thing? Yeah. Okay. Because I want it to be just one shot. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Wait. Am I in focus? You are now. Okay. Go. As you know, Cody Weck... As you guys know, Cody Weber has been directing my videos, but what you don't know is that he's got me chained up in his basement, he's forcing me to make these videos, he's a slave driver, he's an evil bastard. Kill him if you see him, he's evil. Or go subscribe to his channel, one of the two. <laughs> nice. Be entertaining, Weber. What do I do? What do I do? Fascinate me with your fascination of fascinationiness. I'm a fascinating person and people love me. Actually, people on your channel hate me. They're like, oh, you're giving him a shameless plug now. How, mu how much? How much did he pay you for this? Eleven dollars. Did you know that? Thirty-eight cents. People are saying that you are hiring me with your donation money. Yeah, I know. I've heard the theories. That would be. I mean, not you don't gotta give me donation money, but a whole bunch of money would be pretty fucking sweet. Okay, I'll I'll keep that in mind. I love some of the responses that you get on the videos. Yeah. Like I just read one that said like some guy gave you a big like speech on how you should just learn how to do this yourself because anyone that has a basic understanding of video could do what I do. Every video I'm destined to get at least, I mean, I'm destined to get at least 10 people who say like, I've liked everything you've done up until this point, but this video is just a piece of shit. <laughs> Fucking retarded. Can't believe you even say this shit. Unsubscribe. <laughs> I really wish I was a Christian so I could be like, Woman, you read what it says shit. in the Bible. You already do that shit. I'm a Christian now. It'd be really awesome to open a studio here. Hey, um, I'm at the town square in Macomb. I'm looking at uh, the magic dragon, uh, the, well, the spot where the magic dragon was. And uh, I saw your for rent sign. I'm just calling to inquire about uh, maybe running it. So let me know. I don't want to call myself an artist because I don't know if that'll put people off or make it seem pretentious. Because I know that Henry Rollins, you know, he's uh, basically a stand up comedian and he goes around calling himself a spoken word artist because he doesn't want to be saddled with the label of comedian. And I feel like I hate that pretension in him. So. I feel like if I called myself an artist, people would be like, bullshit, you ain't a fucking artist. You rant in front of a camera for a living. But um, if you were going to call me an artist, then my great dissatisfaction as an artist is the way that the internet stifles creativity by exposing you to too much criticism. And you don't get that, you don't get that high. Like, if you're a band in the 1980s and you're on tour... It seems like everyone loves you. You're exposed to practically no hatred because there's no internet and if you read a bad review or something you just figure well that's just one fucking asshole. No one really agrees with him. He's just trying to fucking make a name for himself by dissing me. You know, you're not exposed to like the thousands of people out there that think you're a fucking joke. How could you be? I think it, it discourages a lot of people who are trying to, to come in. They don't really want that they don't really want to share their stuff with the world anymore because it seems like the world is very, you know, um, uh, reluctant to embrace new talents. I mean, even when something does get accepted into popular culture, there's still a huge backlash. Like, you know, if, if uh, and I mean, I'm part of the backlash a lot of the time, like Justin Bieber, for instance. You know, it's amazing how quickly this turns into this. All this hate mail over that Justin Bieber video. Did you write these letters? You're damn right I did, bitch. You know, he gets out there and he's really popular, really big, and then, but, you know, as many fans as he has, there's probably at least fucking 
six or seven times as many people that hate his fucking guts with a passion, that just despise him and, and just wish he would go away. I don't know how you motivate yourself in that sort of climate. Like, everyone might, like, boost our ego a little tiny bit, but then one fucking negative comment can just knock down the Jenga tower. And I've kind of just adapted to it by growing a, a pretty thick skin. Like, I don't take internet trolls very seriously, but, you know, I, anyone who says that they're totally immune to that stuff is lying. I mean, you can't hear negative things about yourself on a daily basis and not take some of them to heart, no matter how much you cognitively resist it. Here's something I'm gonna fucking put out there right now. I'm about to be getting a fucking real job. And I'm not gonna come home and do your job and somebody else's job and then get bitched at and the room is awful and the fair cage smells. I'm not doing that shit anymore. Because it sucks. So organize your song. Being an idiot's awesome. <laughs> oh man. A little more. And I cut this whole fucking wall. And we'll just put a fucking giant fucking tarp and we'll just layer tarps over them. That'll be it. That'll be the solution. Is it going? Yeah. Okay, uh, so I invented a drink, and it's pretty fucking good, actually. I took half of, like, half a tub of this shit, half-baked, it was all that was left in here, and then I did, like, half a tub of this shit, the cinnamon buns, and, um, a banana, and, like, six or seven shots of Jack. And I just blended that shit together, and uh, oh, milk too, obviously for the milk, because like you know you want a milkshake kind of thing going on. But um, yeah, it's pretty fucking good. Like you could taste the Jack, but it's not harsh at all. It's like it's something in like I think it's the cinnamon kind of mellows it out or some shit. It's fucking this is a labor fucking act to fucking prove this fucking shit is not good. It's pretty fucking good. Just try it. No, nah, man, there's something wrong with this fucking shit. I swear on my nah, life. No Scotty, look, I'll drink it you right now. You take a fucking sip of it. Gladly, I will. Look. Film me. Is it, are you getting focused? Is it, is it good? Oh, there you go. As far as it panned out, I don't want it in on me. Okay, good? There you go. Man, there's something fucking still. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with it. It's fucking good. Take a goddamn sip. Come here in the light, though. Why the fuck do you want me to take a sip of this so good? Because it's so man. fucking good. We, we got to, we, 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 yeah, we have to prove to the audience that it actually is good. That's the only fucking catch. So you have to be man, the I'm impartial party. Face. Face. So you did something to this. I did not do nothing. No, come in the light. Come in the light. Well, you could have both done something to it just to fuck with me. Tell me what you fucking did. I didn't do nothing fucking to it. <laughs> I don't fucking believe you, man. I told you it taste fucking god. I came with the idea to begin with. No, you didn't come with the idea, you lying sack of shit. Well, fuck you, idea. I told him to do it. He didn't fucking do it either. Jack on bananas or some bullshit. No. <laughs> you're not some dumb name like that. Oh, what was that thing we were... This is called the rape whistle. The rape whistle? This is the rape whistle. Because if you drink it, you're not getting raped. Yeah. Is it bright enough? The reason we decided to come to Illinois was because it was close. We were going to originally go to Keokuk, which is Cody, uh, Cody's um, 
birthplace, not birthplace, but his, uh, his shackle, you know, everyone has the fucking place they're shackled to, whether they like it or not, and that's kind of his, and we were going to go there, but he didn't want to go there, Scotty didn't want to go there, I didn't really give a fuck, because, you know, whatever, I, I knew that this is going to be a sucky time, that was part of the reason we wanted to come here in the first place, was let's save money by going somewhere where there's nothing to do. I would never do a public service announcement, but for Macomb, Illinois, I would make an exception, and uh, I, I would say... You know, everyone, this is a very important message for you. Like, be really stern, black and white, and be like, do not live in Macomb, Illinois. Lo and behold, something I did not know about the Midwest is it's, it's really cold. So, um, I mean, I knew that, but I didn't really know what cold was at the time. I just had this, like, Louisiana notion of cold, and, and I learned the Illinois notion of cold, and I discovered that I, I have very little interest in it. Where I come from, or I'm used to my whole life is, we don't get snow in the winter. It doesn't snow. You just go outside in December with a jacket. Not even a real jacket. Just like, I guess to people in the north, the term would be a sweatshirt. You wear a sweatshirt. You don't wear a jacket. I mean, there's very few exceptions. That's why people in the south, and you hear like, it's 35 to people in the south, that's, that's the low. They think it's really fucking cold. Whereas around here, 35 is just another day. We're just gonna stand there for a long time looking really dramatic after that to like accentuate the joke. Yeah. Could you do a list of the top 10 anti heroes? That wasn't right. Did you do a list of the top 10 anti-heroes? I don't do that sort of thing. Is that supposed to say <laughs> God damn it, Cody. Well, it, it, it'll look better if the fucking thing's, like, not as lit. <laughs> not as lit? If it's, I mean, if it's lit, it's just... Hello, I'm Lance Sloan. I portray the lovable internet celebrity, the amazing atheist, on YouTube. I'd like to announce that we are starting a new feature on our channel where if you leave the best, most intelligent, most thought-provoking comment, you win five dollars. It's called the Golden Comment. Isn't that nice? You could win money just for not being a total retard. Put a little spoonful in your mouth. Don't let it out until after you say your line. I eat like three bricks a day, and the negative health risks are greatly exaggerated. I see the Comedy Channel is doing some cool things. You know, it's my first time that I get to be completely behind a camera and doing things like I did when I was a kid. I started making films when I was 14, and that's the whole reason I had a YouTube channel in the first place, because I wanted to upload the movies that me and my friends made. But all my friends grew up and they went to college or they joined the military or they started families and went far away. But we all kind of just stopped talking to each other. I don't know any of the people anymore. Don't talk to any of them. And I view the comedy channel as kind of an extension to that. It's me getting to go back to my roots. And, and when we made Bricks, it was almost like I was doing it all over again. And it was a really good and refreshing feeling. I think a lot of people have good ideas for comedy. I think a lot of people, you know, have the you know technical ability to make the videos, but I don't think it's really been put together that well. I mean, if you just look at the people out there now, I think it's very unsatisfying. I think there's a lot of room that people could actually really invest some good ideas and actually put some really good content out there. I mean, I don't think there's enough quality control.
Run, come on. DJ, you're going to hit me with that brick. I'm not going to hit you with it. I'm not even going to throw it at you. I'm going to make sure I miss by 1,000 miles. Go on. All right. Oh, man. You know, we have a lot of ideas, you know, and we really want to move forward with it. We really just want to put something out there that's not directly related to the Amazing Atheist. I mean, I think anything eventually you have to branch out and do other things. And that's where the comedy channel kind of started from. Is like TJ likes that. TJ has always had a flair for comedy in his videos. And he's always wanted to extrapolate upon that and do something that's not exclusive to the Amazing Atheist. You can just do things that are comedy based. And not necessarily that it, it, even the effect that he has to be in the videos or he has to even, you know, produce the videos necessarily, but he just wants to have a bigger impact, I think, on the world and on YouTube and really have more of a message. Even, you know, I mean, if you look at shows like Family Guy, you kind of see that, like, the cultural influence they have. And even though it is comedy and it is a cartoon and it has a bunch of stupid, you know, almost sometimes juvenile jokes in it, but you can still see the profound effect it has on a lot of people in the cultural memes and, and other things. So, I mean, that's kind of like the reason why we wanted to go into comedy as opposed to making some ultra-serious bullshit. Because when you make ultra-serious stuff, I mean, people enjoy it. But, I mean, it's really hard for someone to get into, like, an hour-and-a-half documentary about the inflation crisis. Hi, I'm Lance Sloan. You know, when Paramount Pictures approach me to... Well, you can't do them when I'm still talking. Hi, I'm Lance Sloan. You know, when Paramount Pictures approach me to make a sequel to Brick... Okay, that was really slow. You gotta do it faster than that. Hi, I'm Lance Sloan. I portray the lovable internet character The Amazing Atheist on YouTube. You know, when Paramount Pictures approach me to make a sequel to Bricks... <laughs> very, very believable. Yeah, this is... Uh... Ah, forgive Scotty me. told me to chug this. I told him I'm not gonna chug it unless I can I can do it on camera, so to be possible. I, I guess that's probably, like, what? Would you say four shots, maybe? Yeah, three, four, three four shots. Four. Do it, TJ. Quit being a bitch. Just... Alright. I really not looking Enough for this at all. Enough talk, TJ. Yeah, yeah, Action. Yeah. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up! It's about the content. Shut the fuck up! Shut the fuck up! Shut the fuck up! Shut the fuck up! Shut the fuck up, Shut girlfriend! Shut the fuck up! Don't you go there, TJ! Don't you go there, man! Chug that shit! I'm not looking forward to this at all, man. This is gonna burn the fuck out of my face. Just do it. it! Do it! Do it! Yeah! Woo! Don't push that! Down it all! Down it all! Down it all! Yeah! yeah. You man to man! <laughs> <laughs> TJ, we respect you. That's how I really will drink it once, I'm, once I've drank enough. When I throw it's fucking so like hard to it. Shit, yeah. Yeah. This is what a bad idea looks like. Liz on TJ. Yeah. Here we go. Piss people off. Let's see the magic happen. It's time to piss you fucking people off. Yeah. You fucking off. faggots. <clears throat> it's all on you. Okay. I keep worrying about my hair. Like, eh, does it look good? <laughs> Atheist. Welcome back to Hate Week. I'm here to piss you off again. You got everything. So do you. 
Yeah, but it's okay when I do it. What? Where are we going? We're going by the last house we lived in around uh, Louisiana before we moved to Illinois. Yep, I got people living there. Told you. You are living there. How about that? Yep. It was it was right after we brought Scotty home from the hospital, and we were talking about germs and all this stuff. And I'm telling TJ, you, you know, you, you can't put your fingers in the baby's mouth, and you know all this kind of stuff. And TJ's like, why? I said. Um, because there's germs and you know you don't want to be get anything so anyway he was all on this I hate the baby I hate this I hate that he hated everything at that time and I said TJ you really shouldn't hate hate is not good you know and and you shouldn't hate things and he turns for a minute and he like looks and he's like hmm and like a couple seconds later he goes I hate germs and I said Okay, you can hate germs. <laughs> but that's so typical of TJ growing up because it'd be like always, and it, I guess it's kind of like his dad because he, he was always looking for that way around. If somebody told him something, okay, this is how you have to do this. And TJ would go, hmm, well, I could do it like this and just do it in this roundabout way. And I mean, he was always looking for that way to do things differently or see things he, he always did see things differently than most people and, and usually probably in better perspective than most people for some reason he could kind of remove himself from things and see them like that but he fell asleep oh decorated the bathroom door with my lipstick Still drinking a bottle. Notice he's at grandma's house. I told my grandma, I'm like, don't give him any bottles, grandma. He hasn't had a bottle in two weeks. We've got him off the bottle now. And she's like, oh, okay, I won't give him any bottles. So we come to pick him up a couple hours later and he goes, he comes running out the door and he's like, mommy, grandma gave me a chalky baba. <laughs> Grandma's like, oh. <laughs> that was the same day that he hit Scotty with the bottle. You can see it in his face. And then he's like patting. <laughs> Wish we would have got a picture of the day. That's the bottle. There it is. That's the culprit. And it's glass. Look at that. Oh, look at that one. Mm -mm. <laughs> Sorry for this. It's just really funny to me. <laughs> the sad, I guess the sad thing about this photo is like, most people look at this photo and be like, oh my god, what a fat fucking pig. But I look at that like, man, I used to be skinny. Look at me. Barely any man titties there. And look at this. This, like, today this sticks out way more. Those love handles are way bigger. You know, and these arms are way jigglier. One thing I'll tell you is like, there's a lot more hair since then. I mean, like, that's a shorn-chested motherfucker there. I don't know, I just like this picture. Because, it, it, you know, like, I like the fact that I can look at this and know that I've pretty much always been who I am now. Like, nothing about this picture is like, wow, I'd never do this now, because I totally would. There's nothing in here that, like, that reeks of, like, whoa, man. I would never take my shirt off, wear a Santa Claus hat, and go like this anymore. I like the fact that I haven't matured. Oh, I even I can even see a a fucking uh, little Marilyn Manson drawing I did in the very background there, like a little Marilyn Manson drawing. You can't really—it's not really great resolution, but it's there. 
Yeah, I miss this room. Like, I got all my comic book posters behind me. I got my heavy metal poster behind me. Got Chicks and Thongs and Evil Ernie and Evangelion. Man, I used to be big into comics, but they got so expensive, man. And they fucking... Comic book writers, they don't know how to tell a fucking story. I mean... It's always like this big fucking soap opera. Anyway. Thank you.